Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm really happy to see you here. When I first started painting outside, I'd been painting for a long time. And then a group of me and my friends decided that we were going to paint outside because a couple of them knew how to do it. And I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Not a clue at all. Thankfully, one of my friends is a Buddhist and she's got the patience of a saint. <laughs> and I would ask questions over and over again and she was so kind and so helpful. That was about 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> and every day when I'm out painting and I see new painters, I just go, oh, come ask me a question. Because I don't know if you've ever learned a new skill like when I first learned how to ski, I was about 35, 40. I had to have everything. And I bought probably the first pair of skis when it came time for me to buy that I saw. Just because, oh, I had to have it, I had to have it. Painting is just like anything else. There are thousands of umbrellas, thousands of paints, thousands of palette knives, thousands of brushes, you just need a few to see if you even want to do it. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars. There's a Zorn palette that has three to four colors of paint. And the fewer tubes of paint you have, the better you are at mixing. Because with white, yellow, red, and blue, you can do a lot. The heaviest thing a plein air painter has in their pack is the paint and I'm starting off badly. This is introductions. My name's Kathy Litwin. <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right, paints. Um, whatever paint, well, the oil, the watercolor paints are not very heavy. Um, usually they're dry and you wet them unless you paint out of a tube, but the tubes tend to be small. Um, for an oil painter, the heaviest thing we have in our back to carry some people will preload their palette um, as it saves time when you get there. So they'll, they'll put their palette right, um, the paint right on the palette. One issue with that, although it saves time, if you tip your um, box up to slide it into, close it and tip it up, the paint may slide. So that's an issue. The other thing is um, you will have to reload during the painting process, so you have to put it out. So I generally don't preload if I'm going to, um, like my Saturday portrait where, you know, I'm, I'm inside, I'm not moving around as much, I can preload there. I generally will buy the smaller tubes. I do not buy the larger tubes. These are cheaper, they're, they're easier to handle, um, and they weigh less. I do buy my white in a large tube. If I have another tube at home that is half used, that's the one I carry. I don't carry the full one. I have a plastic container, which is in another state right now, waiting for me to go back to it, um, that I put all my paints in so that they stay corralled in my backpack. Right now I'm just using um, a Ziploc bag. What I do recommend is that you do not use student grade paint. Student grade paint um, has more binder and less pigment in it. So when you go to paint, you're going to be using two to three times as much paint to get the color that you want to achieve. Um, and sometimes they're pre-mixed with other colors to make them look better, but when you start mixing them, the other colors prevent you from accurately mixing the color you're anticipating. Um, many people do not put black in their palette. I've gone with black and without black. I think it's, it's kind of like um, your taste of the month. The reason people don't like black is because it is more of an organic and it's such that it sucks the oil out of the surface and into your um, substrate. This does not count for um, watercolor, but it does count a little bit for acrylic. The positive thing about black, if, if you tint black way out with white, you have blue. So there is some positives to having black with you. It's up to you to decide. So now that we've talked about um, 
that the brands that are good are Windsor, Newton, Gamblin, Rembrandt, Williamsburg, Michael Harding, Rebloff. Those are all good color, um, paint colors. Buy them on sale. If, if you are unfamiliar with going paint shopping, I recommend you make a, a trip to wet paint, and that, that goes true for watercolor, acrylic, and oil. They're very knowledgeable. They may be a little bit more expensive, but they'll spend time with you. Once you have under your belt what you like, then shop online, Jerry's Artorama, Cheap Joe's, the Italian art shop, everything is always on sale. The problem with Jerry's Artorama is you pay for your returns, and your returns go by weight, and a lot of oil painting supplies are heavy. So that's why I recommend you shop. Blick is gotten, has gotten so much better in the last 10 years. If you can't get to wet paint, go to Blick. And if you don't get it, somebody that really knows a lot, just ask for somebody else. It's okay. Michaels has sales all the time. They have good products. The entire store is crafts. So for one salesperson to know a lot about oil painting is really difficult. They try hard. They have great sales. Um, but you may not get as much assistance. And, you know, um, Williamsburg and um, Vasari and Old Holland are expensive. They're handmade, wonderful paint. But maybe not for your first tubes. <laughs> you know, that's a treat when you've been painting and, and you, you're doing it on a routine basis. Leak-proof water containers and sprayers for the um, watercolorist and make sure you've got a sponge and paper towels. Oil painters, no matter what you buy, your solvent will leak, okay? No matter how much, this is an expensive container. Um, the washer has given out several times. What I do is I make sure I go to the hardware store in the middle of the day, okay? When the people who've worked there for a long time are there, not in the, it's their shift, okay? And they'll help you find a washer that fits. And anyway, it will still leak. So carry it in a, a tin can or a takeout food container and keep it upright. It just leaks. I use Turpinoid Natural. It does not have an odor. The green one smells. I don't take this with me. Um, it's a brush cleaner. So I'll take this out so later you can take a peek at this. It holds my solvent. So the solvent I use is odorless. If you go into any studios, you will most likely be required to have odorless uh, mineral spirits. Terpenoid or OMS, uh, which is a gambling product, will be fine. When you're outside, you can go to the hardware store and use turpentine. It just smells really bad, and it gives a lot of people headaches. So if you're okay with it, that's fine, but I would, I would stay away from it, to be honest. All right. Palette knife. I don't like white plastic palette knives because I like my palette knife to have a spring. I don't like it to be hard. This is my hard one. No, this is my hard one. It comes in many sizes and shapes. I like mine to be offset so that my hand doesn't get in the way. This way I can mix, I can paint, and I can clean. And it, it, it stays simple and just remember to clean this one actually was black it was oxidized but over time and wiping with my paper towel has taken the oxidation off do be careful with your palette knife as at, with use they do become sharp okay all right brush types now there i paint with a long bristle brush i start out with hog bristles for me and I finish with a softer. Watercolorists will use a sable and, and soft um, bristles throughout because of the, the, um, they don't need the brush stroke. Um, acrylic, to be honest, because I have a, a tension span of a gnat, I use cheaper brushes because if I'm not careful, quickly the paint will dry and then I can't get the paint off the brush. This is the only time I recommend people 
wash in between almost every stroke. I don't want you to leave it in the, the brush cleaning solution, the water, but I want you to get it wet. And I want you to have a spray bottle, and even though you've got the moist palette, I want you to take paper towels. Before you set your palette out, fold them up and wet them, wet them, wet them. Then put your paint on top and then spray it again. That'll really um, extend the moisture in your palette for acrylic. Yep, oil, you don't have any problem with that. All right, paper towels. Um, I didn't bring a rag. The first thing to ch choose is take, open up your cupboard and get a rag and just use that. And you can reuse it and reuse it. When I started painting, everybody wanted um, you to use Viva. And Viva is the most expensive paper towel out there. And it also leaves filament. So when you scrub down your canvas or do a window, you have little flecks of material left on there. So I use shop towels that I buy on sale at Costco or the hardware store when they go on sale. And these will absorb more solvent in it than Viva or Bounty. It's because they're made for automotive use. This is not made for um, kitchen use. Do not use this in the kitchen for around food. It's, it's not meant for that, but it works great for painting. Okay? So we've got, oh, and brush carriers. You, it's important to put your brushes in something, whether you wrap it around in a paper towel. You, what you're doing is you're protecting the bristles from getting roughed up. So I have a brush carrier like this. There's the bamboo one. You can make one yourself. Just something to keep the brushes from when you're traveling, breaking the bristles and getting them misaligned because that can really wreck a brush quickly. The other thing is, in oil paint, you can use bristle brushes, sable, and, and um, synthetic. It, it is a, a high alert allergen. It gives people headaches and upset stomachs. Um, and over time, your exposure to turpentine is lifelong. You don't, you don't excrete it as easily as other things. So, um, although, you know, my dad, you know, he was a woodworker. He used turpentine and he, that didn't seem to bother him. But, you know, I think the less we expose ourselves. These are the clean solutions. So I have turpentine in one, and if I need it, medium. Thank you for that question, by the way. And I can put it on my palette, and it'll be secure. On this one, I do it here. And this has a tray that I don't have room for. So I put it, this on here, and I put the, and I always put my solvent on the left-hand side and my um, medium on the right-hand side so I don't have to look. It's a memory thing. It's not set in stone by God. It's just so that I put my brush in the right spot, okay? And I do the same thing with my, my, my paint. I always set my paint up in the same way on my palette, and I set it up backwards to everybody else. It's okay. My hand knows where to go, and that's all that matters. You, you go, I go white through the palette to blue, and a lot of people will start blue and go to white. Just so long as you and your palette know what's going on, that's all that matters, okay? And um, these get mucky, so clean them out with, I clean mine out with a product called LA Awesome at the dollar store. It's highly noxious, but it gets everything out. You can use um, Super, Super Green, Murphy's Furniture Oil, yeah. Um, anything that's a good degreaser, because it'll build up over time and, you know, we buy a lot of supplies. It makes sense to keep them as long. What do you use as a medium, did you say? I use Artist Medium. This is one is by Windsor Newton. There are several mediums that you will go through in your life. Buy the smallest container that you can, 
try it out, see if it works for you. I used to use Neil McGlib, it worked well, it gets dry, it turns yellow, you have to add um, odorless mineral spirits to it, worked well for a long time, and I just changed. Just buy a small amount, try it out, and ask around. There's online, uh, you can ask questions on Facebook, you can, there's wet, uh, wet paint, it's a blog, you can ask questions, you can seek answers to your questions real easy. James Gurney answers me, you know. There's people who write blogs. They love to get questions and they'll answer you. He sent me a magazine. Signed. Oh, and these have washers in them also. And these also fail. So, go to the hardware store in the middle of the day, not on the weekend, when the people who work there forever can help you because they know. Sometimes you have to cut them down, but you know, they, they will really help you out. In worst case scenario, Northeast Minneapolis, it, there's a manufacturer of washers, but they would like to sell you 100. <laughs> Wine. We're doing good. The other thing is, is plain, oh, and here, you can, you know, cheap paper towels, it doesn't make a difference, but, as a plein air painter, the reason you're outside is you love where you are. You love the landscape, you love the smell, you love the sounds, you love the way it feels. Pick up after yourself. Be your own mom, okay? People don't want to see our debris rolling around the fields and down the roads. Um, lots of times we don't ask if we can paint on somebody's property or, uh, you know, on the roadside if we're deep in the country. A lot of times they'll come out and ask if you have something wrong, you need help. Um, and then when they find out who you are, they're real happy that you're, you know, recording the history of that place, but treat it with care. We all make mistakes, you know, I've left pallet knives and I've dropped brushes at the bottom of my feet many a time. I, I do search and sometimes I can't find it, but just, you know, be as nice to the land as you can. And with that, you know, when, you're stand, when you find a place that you want to paint, don't break off branches. Twigs are fine, you're going to stamp the grass down, that's fine. But don't do, don't do, you know, you move easier than moving the tree or the lake. I mean, or you can just move it in your painting. Um, so, now the painting surface that you use can be varied also. Originally, everybody, well, not, that's not true. For centuries, people have, have painted on stretched fabric or wood. Um, then it became that everybody had to do stretched fabric. But now, um, since probably early 2000s, panels have become more popular. They're lighter, they're more transpor transportable, and they're less expensive. And there's the stretching you don't have to do any longer. Now, um, with that said, the, the rule of thumb was to um, make a drum sound. Well, this doesn't have a drum sound. Um, you can spray the back, but then the drying is kind of uneven. I don't use stretched canvases anymore. I, I, I stretched for many, many years. I use um, panels on uh, birch wood, cardboard, MDF, um, whatever they put them on. I've made my own. It's a lot of work and it did not save me a lot of money, but I used good product. I used good um, canvas and I used um, carpentry grade birch wood. You can, um, wet paint sells MDF pre-cut. That's pretty inexpensive if you have your own. Centurion is a brand I use because it's inexpensive. It works fine. Raymar is a wonderful project, a product. It's quite a bit more expensive, but it's beautiful. 
it's on a coin on coin on back or um, foam core. You you can pick the level you want. Soltech makes a really nice product. There is a studio, a, a couple that own Lakeside Studio and St. Croix Falls make a wonderful product, really, really wonderful, but it's a little bit on, you know, a little bit more expensive. I don't use Fredericks, a lot of people do. It's a choice. I don't use Blick because Blick has um, heavy grain, so it tends to be better for people that use heavier paint than I do. Um, Michael sells product called Art Materials. I use that. I'm not as fond of it, but it's, it's all what you get used to. Um, what's more important is how you store your paintings when they're done. If they're down in a damp basement, you know, that's not gonna be good for just about anybody. So that's a little bit on you. The other thing I've been doing lately is I do a, a I go to a portrait group on on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and so I'm coming up with all these portraits that nobody's going to ever see. So I've been painting on canvas, canvas, so it's not mounted on anything. And I think there's one that that ripped. So if I find one that I like. Oh, it must have fallen out. I had a ripped one here. Oh no, it's got a clamp on it. I, I, do put, I do put it on a board. So this is just canvas, and you can tell it wouldn't come off so it ripped. So I will just cut this down to an 8x10 or an 8x12, and then still use it. So if I did a painting, and you know, if I taped it on a board and went out and did a plain air painting, and I really liked it, I would let it dry completely and then I would take a, I would go and get a piece of um, MDF, plywood, if it's, if it's not construction grade, cabinetry grade plywood you should shellac both sides so it doesn't warp. Even the small ones like to warp. So it takes a little bit of time. And then I just, you can go to either Blick or Wet Paint and there's a, a neutral pH paste that's a book binders paste that you, um, it, it's the consistency of Almer's glue and you can thin it out with water if it gets thick. You just paint it, um, paint it or roll it on the back side, put it on your, on your um, ground and then press it out. Now I usually, when I uh, make my own panels and they're um, not painted on. I use a brayer, which is a book binders. Um, it looks like a, a rolling pin or, you know, a paint, what you paint walls with, a paintbrush or paint roller. Yeah, but you have to be careful if you painted on it already that you don't push the texture of your paint strokes down. So um, you, you, you do it carefully and then you as gently as possible, put something on top of it to hold it down until it's dried. But it does work. It just, I wouldn't put a heavy, if you use the brayer, just do it really lightly. And then, you, and then it should be fine. How to get your paintings home once you've done it. Now the water paper people tape their paper to a support system and it, unless it's really rainy, is basically dry. Acrylic people can paint on illustration board, tag board, heavy tag board, or panels. Um, and yours, generally speaking, will be dry by the time you get you, you pack up, unless you put um, you know that stuff that you use to make it. Wow, oh, I can't think of the word. Well, no, it's, it, it, it's thickness. It, it'll make it look like sand. It's like you put sand. It's an additive. Yeah, so generally you will be fine. Um, but I think even for you it's a good idea to even have it just a cardboard box. And if any of, it, any of you have cats, for some reason cats are attracted to paintings. So I've heard more horror stories about 
pastel and, and tail, you know. <laughs> so maybe keep it in your car. I don't know, my, my dog likes the, the paper towels. So you learn what your owner likes. Or <laughs> okay, so they're, like, they're just interested in what you're interested in and the, you know, your smell is there, so be aware of it. Um, I, I spent many years just with box tops. And if you leave, if you leave your, your painting in the car in the summer, it will bake. So it'll be a quick dry, which is good. This is a wet panel carrier made by a gentleman outside of, uh, somewhere outside of Chicago. Super nice guy. You can carry two wet panels in a panel pack. They come in different sizes. Um, you have to be careful with them, though, that you get them in the, the ledge here so that the, it doesn't fall in. And they come in just about every size. They're not real expensive. Raymar is another product that's out there. And remember, when I give you a product, there are many more products out there. These are what I'm familiar with. You can take them, take and look at them, but know what you like and then keep looking. And that's what you need to do. This will carry three, four wet canvases in it. They slide, there's rails in here that the, the panels will slide into, and then they're secure. These come in more sizes also. The strap is um, adjustable. The, comp the Raymar company, when you call them, they are super helpful. If you have any problems, any concerns, Gorilla makes boxes. Theirs tend to be cardboard so that they're even, they're less expensive. You can put two frames together and hinge them with a rubber band, and that can be a wet paint carrier. So there's many options. Don't buy anything right away. Use the box and look around. Do your shopping. Because these things last a long time. They're not flimsy. You know, somebody put this together and he thought a lot about it, and they're hard. I broke one, and he said, you broke it? How, how in the world did you break it? I said, well, it was winter, and he said, well, you buy another one, I'll send you a new one. So I bought a 9 by 12 and he replaced my 8 by 10 I, I, call, I put an order in for a size that I didn't have this fall, and he got it, and it hit FedEx by 5 o'clock that day. I got it the next day. You know, that's... I don't get my own mail that fast, you know? It was, it was amazing. Now before I go to, um, you know, the painting setup, these are, these are the simplest tools on earth, and I think that they're the, the most important for beginners and for medium people, you know, medium level people to go back to and use again. The first one, it's called a viewfinder. So you set the size of the opening to the size you're going to paint. And then you sit there and then you pick your composition. And you're going, well, I know what the composition is. Like I said before, I have a problem with attention. So I find that, you know, I, I like that tree, but all of a sudden I'm picking up a tree over here. And then I'm going, well, okay, then I got to get all this in there. So if I use the viewfinder and I say, okay, the edge of that car window is hitting the left corner, I give myself um, spots and I say them two or three times so that when I come back up and I always try and straighten my arm out so that it's at the same, my arm doesn't change in length and I try and keep it directly in front of me. The, the guys, and the women that have been painting for a long time can set those boundaries instantaneously because they've done it. It's muscle memory. They know how to do it. They don't even think about it. It's like breathing. And then if they want to take a tree from over there, they're doing it intentionally. They're making that choice. If they bring clouds in that, that aren't there and the sky is really boring, they bring clouds in. But it's intentional. What was happening to myself was in, unintentional. 
You know, I was just, oh, it's nice. I'm going to put it in. And then I just, I would, I would fish, you know, and then I, I didn't know where I was going. And then I'd wipe, which, by the way, wiping is a great thing. It makes you feel so good to get rid of that painting. And you can still use the panel. Wiping is cathartic. It's really a good thing. And for acrylic, get that tube of white paint out and just cover it up. It's okay because you're practicing your starts. You're doing a good job. And that, that's another thing, you know, painting is hard. It's really hard. And if you're out there painting and you're alone, it's only you in your head. And so you have to be real careful about what's in your head. If you are negative in your head, forget it. Nobody's going to keep painting. <laughs> You, you're just gonna go, you're gonna go home and say, I spent all this money and I didn't have any fun. So you have to come up to, with ways to be your own best cheerleader. You have to say, okay, you know what? I don't really like this, but find something to like and then go off that. And you're gonna have good days and bad days, but any day you go out and paint is gonna be better than a day at home in front of the TV, you know? You might get sunburned, you might get bitten, but it's gonna be a whole lot more and you're gonna feel good. So be kind, be your own cheerleader, and only take what you can carry. Unless you have a Sherpa, and then make sure you tip them well, because it's heavy, okay? Remember that, only take what you can carry. Do I sound like a preacher? All right, painting setups. There's five here, and there are probably 200 more out there. I taught a, a plein air class at a small art center in Minneapolis to teenagers, and I had a 15-year-old that came with a, a plein air box made out of a cigar box. Her and her dad had spent two nights putting this painting thing together, and it was beautiful and she painted her heart out. You don't need expensive stuff. You can buy used stuff on eBay. You can buy it. Craigslist, well, you, does anybody buy it Craigslist anymore? I don't know. Facebook has a marketplace. Um, you can buy it used. This is on loan. This is called the Gorilla Box. It's on loan from Wet Paint. They were gracious enough to loan me this for tonight. This was one of the first boxes that I saw that I knew about, and everybody seemed to have it. Other, well, I take that back. The French easel was the first. The French easel was created in the 1800s, and it allowed people to go outside and paint in nature. The benefit to the French easel is that um, it carries paint and it carries brushes and some supplies. This is a half of a French easel. Um, the typical one is twice as big and has twice as much storage space. And then most people, um, Judith wanted me to make sure you know that this is not the way to paint on it, it's her way. Typically people will paint on it this way, but she has built up, I don't, she's got pegs here. So when she closes it, the paint, is kept in there and then she goes home and puts it in a bag and throws it in the freezer. So that was her little ditty there. So French easel is favored by more men than women, but I know some women that love it intensely. And the reason is it is awkward and heavy and there's a lot of little doohinkies that you have to, you have to <laughs> tighten up you know, the wing nuts, and, and, and if they're not tight when you're walking through the woods, you're going to lose them. So I am not one of those people that checks my doohinkies very well. So I bought one, and I was really gleeful when I sold it. But the people that have them love them, and they have them for years. Um, you just have to take care of the stuff. Now, so this is the Gorilla um, box that I originally, I was telling you about. They're, they're not 
in as much favor now as they were. They're not making as many as they were. Um, it's self-contained. There's a deep cavity here for paint and brushes. And then you secure your panel right here. So the panel is not elevated. It's very close, close to your paint. Um, but it's a, a little bit limited in, in size. It's very lightweight. It's really well constructed. You need a tripod. You need a tripod and a, a head to mount it on. This is, was my second one. This is an open box M. This is lightweight. It's very durable. I, use, I, have, I had a piece of acrylic put in the bottom of this so that I wasn't messing up the wood. The nice thing about acrylic or glass is that when you clean them, you can clean them off with alcohol and it takes the paint right off. Um, the problem for me, again, miss, you know, don't pay attention to things, is it has little doohinkies all over the place and I'm getting them caught on everything in my backpack because I travel in a backpack and it oh it was driving me nuts it has a nice shelf that attaches here that I can lay my brushes on and it has a wider array of um, sizes that it'll accept because um, you're just limited by um, these brackets on the side so this is as wide as you can go, but you can go pretty high. Generally speaking, plain air painters don't go much beyond 12, six by, um, 12 by 16 because you're gonna blow away. And it's, it's just, it's hard to keep it. Uh, Scott Lloyd Anderson does bigger than that, but you know, he's taller than me by about a foot, so. And this is the Ella Prima Prashad. This is uh, the one I was using before. Lovely backs, handmade, yep, a la prima Peshad, and this is the bitter root. Handmade, Bozeman, Montana. Talked to the guy many times, nice guy. My problem is I overbought. It's too heavy. Only carry what you can take in and out. So this has a self-contained storage system for wet panels. It has two shelves that attach. It has um, magnets that you can put your palette knife on and it'll stick and not blow away. It's a lovely, lovely system. I, I really like it. But if you're gonna hike for a mile or two, it gets... And my current one right now is a two-piece part. This is the prolific painter. It folds up. I can't take this off of the, uh, the painting won't fall down, but it's got two hands that go onto my tripod. And it's, there's many systems. There's a Coulter system that's like this. Um, there's, there's many varieties that are similar to this. And then it has a staff that, I'm gonna have to take this off that holds the panel between these two adjustable. So, and there, he has um, a larger staff than this, and then this just comes off. So it, it packs up really slick. Lot of varieties of this. You don't have to go with what I have. I, and then there's a Yugo, which doesn't, these all go on a tripod. A Yugo is a, a beautiful uh, setup that tends to be held in your lap, so it's easier for travel. It's made out of, it looks like it's made out of a beautiful birch. And it's you, typically for um, smaller, six by eight, eight by 10, eight by 12, maybe is the max. And then there's a Sienna, which is, um, I think it's made by the rich, or it's distributed by the Richardson, Nate, um, not Nature Center, Richardson company, company in Wisconsin. There's a big um, art company in Wisconsin called Richardson. Make paint, but I think they make just about everything. So this is not to promote 
any of these. It's to show you what's out there. It's really up to you to find out what works best for you, and it's all about weight and carryability. The tripods, um, you can buy tripods used. You can buy them used online. The one problem with a tripod is if you use this type of system where the pallet hangs off the tripod, you have to make sure that the tripod is tall enough to have the, the pallet at your level. A uh, dear friend of mine was going to France and, and so she wanted a lighter weight system to travel and she bought this tripod um, from a company out east and the tripod was this tall so she, <laughs> she, she would have to sit. You know and most painters don't sit. I mean they will, some do, but m most won't. Um, oh we are doing good. Um, I like to periodically have value checkers. So paint gets all the glory, value does all the work. If you never remember who I am, remember that color does all, gets all the glory and value does all the work. Without the correct values, you will have a photograph. It will be flat. So if you take, you know, red acetate film, it takes the color away, and so then you're able to see the values, okay? You can make your own, or for, I think it was $13, you can buy a piece of acrylic that you know, I think my sheet was $4 and I made about 12 out of it. But that gets dinged and so will this. So it's up to you. I kind of like starting out cheap and then if I... I bought a sheet. Red acetate. And I cut it and I put it in between two pre-cut doohinkies, things, mats. Do you hold that at arm's length? Look at your painting or how it do that? doesn't matter. And then, you know, there's always the zero through 10 value checker to see where you are. I really recommend you take a photograph of what you're, uh, of what you're painting and then go in and edit it and move it over to black. And that way, if your values are all close together, you can either choose to lighten and darken or look for a different scene. It really helps to make sure that it's not all the same value. And I know we all know the color wheel. We all know this. I know this. But to be honest, I have it mounted three places in my basement where I paint. And I have done um, Schmidt's color panels. I did one panel for every color. I know how to mix, but I get arrogant. And this gets me back to what the basics are and what I need to pay attention to. Oh, I know how to do that. I can do this. Color? No, sure I can. But, you know, so I check myself. And I, I really think the basics are key to painting. That and keeping your brushes clean, which I clean my brushes every time I use them. I, I rinse them out with um, my solvent when I'm on location, and then when I go home, eh, maybe the next day it might be, but I've cleaned them out with solvent. I, I do soap them out with masters or um, you know some kind of degreasing. So I don't use Dawn because Dawn is too harsh. It's such a strong degreaser that especially the um, natural bristle soaps, it'll break the tips. It's just too strong. Because then you have to go find some hair conditioner that you want to put in and put that in there. And it, then it makes the process way too prolonged. All right. Now, the other thing, and this is, this is down to um, safety. And that's also a tool. 
Number one, when you go out, make sure somebody knows where you are. Especially if you are in a location like Red Wing. <laughs> because, the, or Bloomington, Minnesota, let me tell you, I don't have cell, cell phone service at my house. So when you're going through the rivers and valleys, you are coming in and out of cell phone service, which I was down by, there's a storage facility down here and I was painting in the <laughs> parking lot and I stepped down the hill and I couldn't stop stepping and I was with the friend, but if I had fallen down and needed help, what would I have done? You know, I mean, I didn't get injured, but I couldn't stop. I mean, the hill was, it just took me down and we weren't in cell phone service area because I was down in the ravine. You know, there's been places out um, flat, flat, flat fields, but there's hills on either side. So it's a good idea if you're alone and you don't have somebody with you just to have somebody know, I'm sorry, I should put my hand there, um, to know where you are. Number two is it's a good idea in Minnesota if you can deal with it to wear long pants and socks and sturdy shoes. Um, we have uh, an onslaught now of noxious plants that are out there and we have a hideous amount of ticks. And then beyond that, we have black flies and mosquitoes. So it's, it's a good idea if you can tolerate the temperature to wear long pants, socks, and a decent pair of shoes. You know, something that, like a hiking shoe or a good sneaker, and nothing that you're gonna wear, you know, for date night. <laughs> Because that is not going to work. Um, the other thing is, I I have a paint shirt that I dipped in a bag of of um, tea water because this is a fishing shirt, and it is made of polyester, so it reflects light. And when you're painting outside in the sun, you should either be in a dark color or something non-reflective and. I, I ding this up with tea because it does, it will reflect, it will give an odd reflection on your panel. So I have a paint shirt that I can put over my clothes. It, it's taken me years not to come home totally covered in paint. So I dedicate, and you can buy these at used clothing stores, you know, you can buy the lightweight pants at used clothing stores, you can buy them at REI, it doesn't matter, just so long as you're um, protecting yourself from the heat, the sun, the noxious plants, and the bugs. I was here one year and, and I was um, staying with a lady and she goes, why do you all wear such funny hats? <laughs> And I said, well, it's because of the glare. So you wanna, you wanna have a hat. Now a baseball hat works most all the time and it works even in the winter if you put a, a stocking hat on top of it. I know you don't look great, but it's keeping you warm, okay? So this is really helpful. If it's hot, a visor works as long as you don't burn on your head but your ears still, because I always put my hair behind, so you have to, okay. And the best, but the most susceptible to wind is a wide-brimmed hat. You know, and they can be made out of anything. They can be straw, they can be felt, they can be tie-dyed, they can be painted, but it really, it covers your shoulders, it covers your ears, it covers your nose, and it prevents the glare. Um, Gloves, I wear, I'm trying to wear gloves because I use um, cadmium-based paints and watercolorists actually do have cadmium-based paints. I am getting to the point where I can get through half a painting before they're on the ground or whatever. The most comfortable are the cheap ones you buy at somewhere at the garden store. So I have um, rubber or plastics here and then it breathes. 
the the plastic <clears throat> gloves you get at you know like the dentists use and the doctors use my hands are sweating and sweat drips down and it's just gross and I'm hot already so this is much more comfortable and at least try to use it on the hand that you wipe your brushes off with um, I do have an app on my phone that will identify noxious plants because I'm horrible at identifying um, poison ivy. I'm pretty good at, at um, wild parsnip when it's not in the baby form, when it's up here and it's got the nice um, umbrella shape. To, I'm pretty good at that. That's a good I, thing to have with you. Make sure you're aware of the weather report, not where you are, but where you're going. And as important as the rain forecast is the wind forecast. Always look down before you set up and watch out for um, ant mounds. It's hard when you're real, all set up and you've just started something and you feel something crawling up your legs. <laughs> you know, it's just an awful feeling. Make sure you take more water than you think you could ever drink and make sure you take, you know, five minute breaks every 20 minutes and drink. So I do have, um, I'm doing good. I do have chairs that I have purchased. They tend to be uncomfortable for any long-term sitting and if you're at, at an angle, you always feel like you're going to get thrown out. So I'm not a big proponent of chairs. And you have to remember you've got to get it there. You've got to carry it yourself. So every time you add an element, you're adding more weight. And um, sometimes you can just put your coat on the ground and sit down and take a break. I do have three umbrellas. Um, and I leave these in my car. This umbrella is an independent standing umbrella. You could use it in your backyard. You have to weight it down either with your backpack or the, the whatever it is you're carrying your supplies in. So there's a gust of wind, it won't take off. Um, so I only use this when I'm roadside painting so that I don't have to carry it. I take it in my car, I set it up, I weight it down, we're good to go. This best buddy was my first umbrella. And I'm hooked. Tell me how I'm doing with everything. Okay, so this pushes into the ground. It has a, a stake you push in. So it's good when you're in a a cultivated field or a grassy knoll or a park that's not manicured. You can't do this on asphalt or gravel. In some land that's not been um, cultivated, to, you know, it, it's just so hard, it won't go in. And then this will fit on, uh, um, this is an easy L, and this will clamp onto a box or a, a tripod setup because there's a clamp down there and it's extendable. When you put an a, a umbrella on a paint box system, you're a little bit like Mary Poppins. <laughs> so you have to make sure you've got plenty of weight counterbalancing it. Um, it's amazing how you concentrate really hard and you don't really realize what's going on. And all of a sudden you get a gust of wind and there goes everything. And it happens to me all the time. Um, many people don't paint with, with umbrellas. They just turn around so that they don't look into the sun. If it's something that you really wanted to paint, then I don't know, you, you can figure it out. These tend to be a little, uh, on, I don't know, they're kind of expensive. I like them a lot, but they're a pain to travel with. You know, there's pros and cons. And there's more. Uh, one of my friends that lives, that just about everybody here knows, she holds her umbrella. She, so she just holds it while she's painting. That's taking care of a lot of equipment. 
but she can do it. So now this, because it's black, is like standing under a really deep, dark tree. And so it, it, it um, alters the color on your palette. So it changes the color a little bit because it's black. Um, and so then I tend to paint less chromatic. And it's hard, it's so then I went to this, but it's black underneath. So I, but it attaches, so I can do it like if I'm, if I go to Minnehaha Falls, you know, it's all paved. I, I can get some light away from there. Um, and I do have, I have a, a photographic umbrella that my um, brother-in-law put into a, a round thing that I can use, but the staff is shorter for the photographic umbrella because they typically have more adjustments, so I have to kind of lean under it. But it, then it what that does is diffuse. And when it diffuses the light, then I don't get glare. Because glare on the panel and glare on your paint is what's hard. And if you're, if you're looking at your panel and the, and the sun is right there, it's, it's really hard on your eyes. It, do, it doesn't do damage to your eyes, but it, your eyes just get so tired and it's, it's harsh. Oh, and things in the car. Plain air painters tend to look like they live in their car because you should have extra shoes and socks, a sweater, a raincoat, and until mid-July, you should have a winter coat. Just get a suitcase, just get in a scarf, and maybe some mittens if you don't have gloves because the, win the weather can change on you. There have been twice when I was up in Grand Marais doing a quick paint when it was sunny, it rained, it grappled, it snowed, and then it quit. And that was 90 minutes. I was out on a farm south, no, north of Red Wing. It was kind of cold. You know, it wasn't too bad. I set up. I, the farmer gave me permission to be in his backyard. This huge, because it was a valley, this huge wind came through. I grabbed everything. I picked it back up. Huge rain. Grabbed my paint, picked it back up dumped snow on me. I mean, and I had only been there an hour. And I, I said, I think it's time for hot cocoa. You know, I, just, it, I, was, I was exhausted. I didn't pay attention to the weather report. It was my day to paint. So sometimes you have to be a little more flexible. Um, when you're painting with a canvas, a stretched canvas, if you notice, I don't know, can you, can, you, can you tell that you can see through it? So you would, and when you have it here, it doesn't matter because it's blocked, right? The sun's not going to, when you have it up here, you won't see where the staff is, but you'll see every place else. So it's a good idea to carry something you can slip behind it. It can be cloth, it can be cardboard, it can be those sun visors for your car, you know, the kind that you put in when you're getting out of your car, and they roll up into a circle. Those tend to be pretty small, and you can stuff those behind. And then you can also use it to keep your car cooler when you get out of it. Um, so if you do stretch canvases, that's what I would recommend. All right. Well, I hope you paint. I hope you do. It's fun. It's work, it's hard, but you know, it keeps your brain going. And don't just go, you know, every time I would teach a class, people would come with so much stuff. And you don't need to start with everything. You need black, white, red, yellow, blue. You need four brushes, small, medium, and two a little bit larger. You need, you don't need to buy 40 of, of whatever you're using. Start with two or three. See if you like the texture. You might not like the texture. It's okay. So just start out s small. And then make time to treat yourself to paint. Because if you call it a chore or a job, you won't. But if it's your treat, 
it's your candy bar, then you'll do it. You know, and, and, and find somebody to go with, to, especially to start with. They don't have to paint with you. They could read a book, they could journal, they could urban sketch, they could um, landscape sketch, they could listen to a podcast and enjoy the sun. Just take somebody with you for a while. It helps, it makes it easier. And watch those bugs. No, 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 I started off doing still life and portraiture in a building, in a co controlled setting, except the light, I, I painted with natural light. I did that for a long time, and it was super intimidating to get to a place where I have three hours, that includes setup and, and basically takedown. I have no bathroom within reach. I have to bring my own water. If I forget a pay, you know, my color, it's not behind me in the drawer. It's 20 miles away. It was very intimidating. and. Um, I think I'm just really stubborn, um, but I, I, I like it, I, I don't know. It makes me feel good to be outside and to document what's not going to be here next year or the 10 years down. Like, that building, I don't think it's there anymore. I don't even think the tree is, you know. We don't own, where did he go? Oh, we don't own this anymore. This, this puppy is 13 and has turned into a wildling. He's a man now. <laughs> you know, things change. I like being able to look back at, at my history, you know. And it doesn't have to, I'm a realist. It doesn't have to be realism. It can be abstract it can be whatever whatever your style is is good thank you for your time you. Ta -da. i hope i didn't bore you good take it slow be nice it's hard and remember color gets all the praise, value does all the work. <laughs> <laughs>